The advice and opinions expressed by the hosts of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and we are webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. It's Wednesday. So excited to be here with you today. We've got so much to talk about. Uh, first, we have Ask Dr. Doreen. Dr. Doreen Grandpuche is here, and she's going to be answering your questions live. And then a little bit later on, we have Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. Normally, Nancy Allspot Jackson is here with me, my, my partner in crime. Unfortunately, Nancy is not here with us today. As you saw, if you look on Facebook and are friends with Nancy, and I hope that you all are, uh, Nancy took a very unfortunate spill on Saturday morning and bonked her head, and so she is on bed rest, and we hope that she gets better. I saw her briefly last night. She is okay. I want you all to know that, but she is supposed to be laying down. So, Nancy, if you're watching, lay down. Uh, but that she's here with us in spirit, and during that hour, we will have Elaine Hall from The Miracle Project is going to be here with us. You know her from Autism the Musical, and she's got some very exciting things to talk about with us about what she's got going on this summer and the new NEA grant that she got. How much do we love that? So we'll be talking with Elaine Hall a little bit later. But first, we have Dr. Doreen Grampuche with us for Ask Dr. Doreen. And as I said, she is going to be answering your questions. I don't know about you, but I've got some questions for her about some of the events that happened last week, both the article in the New York Post, but all then the terrible tragic shooting that happened at UC Santa Barbara. So we want to talk about some of the coverage that's happening and answer some of the questions that you guys have already been writing in about that and more questions. I want to remind you that this whole show is meant to be interactive and there are lots of ways for you to participate. Emily's going to show you some of the different ways that you can be talking with us, some of the different ways that you can be putting your questions forward and ways to watch the show as well. Remember that our homepage is autism-live.com. When you go there, there's lots of different things things for you to do. I really want to urge you to sign up to be on our newsletter. We've got some really exciting things coming in the pipeline for you on the newsletter that are going to save you money. You're going to love it. So please participate and encourage others that you know to participate and sign up for the newsletter. Also realize that on that homepage, you have our live feature. So that's the two white boxes that are there. Put your cursor in the box that says your question. Type whatever you'd like there. Hit enter and it will show up here on our screen screen and then that way we can be having a conversation with you in almost real time. There's about a two minute lag so make sure that you ask your question early so that I can make sure that I get it answered. Uh, without further ado, it is time for Ask Dr. Doreen. Dr. Doreen Grand is the Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Doreen Grand Dr. Grand Dr. Doreen Grand Dr. Doreen Grand is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. We're so thrilled that Dr. Doreen Grandpache is here with us in the house, as mm. they say, right? Answering your questions. So glad that you're here today. It's a pleasure. Good morning. Uh, good morning. And I'm uh, always thrilled to have her here because Dr. Grandpache is a true expert in the field of autism. But beyond that, she's a visionary in the field of Thank autism. Thank you so much. And if you. ever we needed a visionary, it's now, right? Thank you well, very much. I appreciate it. And I, I hope that our show does help a lot of our viewers. Um, we want to be very careful, of course and tell people right off the bat that our guidance is just that it's 
you know, we're trying to advise places you can go to get support and, and help, but we wouldn't want you to think that anything we say on this show is specifically intended for your child. We really are not receiving enough information, nor do I know your children, um, so it's impossible for me to give very um, specific uh, direction to you. But having said that, we it's, it's a lovely opportunity for us to pick your brain for information because you know so much more than we can ever hope to know about I, I'm autism. I'm very happy to share whatever I've learned over the past well, 30 years from my families and kids and And it is helpful to, and, to uh, us. I, I know I, I love having a front seat learning from you and also uh, the parents write in all the time and say how much they appreciate what you have to say. That's wonderful. And how much hope you give all really of us. Really glad to hear that. Which is really super duper important. I, I, I want to start, and we, we have a question um, that relates to this, to talk a little bit about some of the events that transpired over the weekend. If you guys watched yesterday, we talked a little bit about this, that on Thursday, the Washington Post printed an article about a new study. It was a very, in my opinion, irresponsible headline that said, uh, you know, significant link between mass murder and autism and then comma brain injury and went on to detail a study that a lot of people are, are um, saying is really arbitrary and doesn't take hard facts into consideration. But so we went on the tails of that to Friday, this horrible shooting. Horrible, horrible yeah, event. Yeah, really, really horrible. First of all, I haven't read the, the article that the Washington Post referred to. I'm very interested in reading that. Um, but yeah, the Friday event was very close to me. As you know, my yes. daughter Nikki goes to UC Santa Barbara, and it was, uh, fortunately, she was here in LA with me when this happened. But how, how, how the way that I found out about it, actually, so before it hit the news, was that Nikki was with me, and she was telling, she was showing me texts that, and pictures that she was receiving from her roommates and her friends at on campus or at IV um, Isla Vista, um, where the kids were hiding under the tables at the Habit Burger, which is right there, and they were, you know, taking selfies because at that point they thought this is fun or something. They didn't know what's coming yet. And so um, it was. A, I followed it very, very closely the entire weekend because it directly impacted our lives and, and my daughter's life. And it was, um, it was very sad, very, yes. very sad. And um, yeah, of course, right away I um, looked on. You know, the first news that I received in the morning, I guess, on Saturday, on Friday, it was just mainly through the the Nikki's friends. Yeah. It wasn't really out there yet, I don't think. But Saturday early morning, I start. I got. A no I get notices from BBC News and so mm -hmm. on, CNN and so on. And it was interesting because what you got on BBC was always much more than what you get on US channels, which is kind of interesting. But they named the shooter and they mentioned his video way before any of the US sources were doing mm -hmm. that. So then I went on and looked at YouTube and his uh, the variety of different videos that he had there there and started to learn things about the fact that he had written a you know 140 page manifesto and had sent it to so many people including his parents and that his mother had been so concerned and had actually called the police and asked them to go check on him and she was on her way driving to Santa Barbara when she heard on the news all this stuff happening and yeah. I mean how horrifying for that mother I feel so bad for his parents I really do yeah. I, of course I can't even fathom how the other parents, the parents oh. of the children who were killed, uh, were feeling. I mean, I'm just, it's, it's the most devastating thing ever. It's so unnecessary, you know? Absolutely. And and then, of course, as this whole thing went on, to learn that he... You can tell, obviously, watching for the, the tapes, that he has some um, mental disability or issues there's no question he's not really understanding uh things properly and he's uh, very upset um but you know whether or not i would i would very much hesitate in terms of jumping to a conclusion and saying he had asperger's or he had anything to do with the autism spectrum i don't know i would have to i can't tell from that video alone i can see that he has 
some social problems, no, no question, he's not really understanding social norms appropriately. Uh, but then, you know, there are lots and lots of children out there or adolescents and teenagers who become stalkers or, you know, become extremely upset and so on and so forth that we don't call them Asperger's right, right. away and we don't label them and we don't say, oh, that's what justifies this or whatever it is. I mean, yeah. this is a very complicated case. And um, But I did hear after the fact that he had been receiving a lot of uh, mental health care services. That seems to be one of the things that's uh, reported in, in every single venue that he had been getting some sort of psychiatric care from a very early age. But the reports are conflicting about whether there was an actual diagnosis and even even reports that are very close to the family. One who said, the apparently the lawyer for the family said that there had been a diagnosis. Um, and But then a, a close family friend said that's not accurate, that the family felt that he might be on the spectrum, but that there had never been a formal diagnosis. So, you know, a lot of it is speculation at this point mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and and yet people were jumping to conclusions well but I, it's also very interesting to me and this is these are things that we may or may not find out for sure but you know it, it would be interesting to find out more about his roommates and or his uh, the, the the young men who were living with him who lost their lives as well. Yeah, the, a, a most recent report um, seems to confirm, and again, we're not, but they're reporting this in the LA Times that he was living in a assisted living situation that was designed specifically for people who need more support, which leads us all to believe that the roommates that he killed were also people who needed more support, which is particularly poignant to me. I, well, yes, extremely. And why have we not learned more about the those individuals there are, exactly. there's a lot of coverage on um, which is you know I, I have to tell you like I can't even uh, mr. Garcia I think is the name of the father who was yeah. who, who was giving a speech about his son and so on and that just tore my heart out the the father who's saying the, the enough gun is control, enough, enough right. is enough right and, but he was that son was the one he was the last one who was killed that was killed and he was not one of the ones the roommates living exactly with so mr. Garcia's son was had just been at the improv show, which you know my daughter goes to on Friday nights, and had just gone to the deli that my daughter goes to to get a sandwich or something. He actually walked into the deli shot, and there's footage of that, right? Which is devastating. Um, but and he was the last. Um, and then of course there were the two girls, um, who you know it's extremely sad. One of my friends. Um, daughters also goes to UCSB and, and one of the girls who was shot was her roommate mm. um, and so those two girls were in front of the sorority and thank the Lord that nobody opened the sorority doors because the shooter was actually trying to get in wow. so but then we heard very very little uh, in fact I don't think I think two of the three gentlemen or boys who were who were um, stabbed yeah. to death uh, one of them we don't even know his name so we got very very little information about those three and uh, you know I my sympathy is with those families and what a devastating and a horrible experience um, and I wish that we were privy to all the facts here because on the one hand, you know, we who are in the spectrum of autism are very defensive about these things, I think, because we don't want autism or Asperger's or ASD to be associated with only negative things um, that isn't right, that is not the case. Uh, on the other hand, yes, part of the disability, not just Asperger's, but many other disabilities, if you have, uh, if you are not able to rationally understand uh, social behavior, then uh, you might, you know, it is, it, it helps us understand where the shooter was uh, coming from in terms of he was so angry at the world and it really all had to do with uh, how girls did not like him and you know the the rash being able to understand that and to be able to continue to survive and like yourself and to overcome you know not hate yourself and not feel such a reject and so on and so forth 
all of that sh is help that should have been given to him sometime in his lifetime. Yeah. And that's it's sad as well. It's a reasonable expectation. And and I know that we're focusing a lot, and they're they're calling him the, the virgin murderer, and we're focusing on the whole aspect of the girls because he talked about that in the manifesto and on the video. But we're also getting reports that in the recent months that in someone uh, dangled him over a balcony and that they were making fun of him, dangling him by his feet over a balcony, threatening to drop him. You know, it... We have to remember that as a community, we we all share in this loss right. in so many different ways. Right. So many different ways. But I, I in, in moving forward, because we have to, right? We have to pick up the pieces and we have, to, we have a responsibility to learn from this. Uh, you know, it's like, where do we start? But somebody has written in a question that says, what do I say to the mom who now thinks that my kid is a potential mass murderer? Mm. And she said, so mad. Oh, yeah. gosh, there's so many sides to this. All I guess all we can do is just continue to educate people. That's all you can do. Um, I know it's very offensive. Um, we as parents become very defensive about this type of thing because we are offended when someone, um, you know, thinks that the entire uh, spectrum of autism are, are dangerous or people who are dangerous. It's just such ridiculousness. Yeah. But at the same time, it's an opportunity that you have to educate um, this other, all these other parents and to tell them uh, it has nothing really to do with the spectrum of autism. It really just has to do with any any person. You don't need a label for this. Anyone who feels so begrudged from society, perhaps, uh, you know, we talk about mass mass shooters or murderers in the, in the past who have been bullied, and you can think of it in the same way, really, because. You know, we see the, those people, we see them as victims in some ways because we say, oh, they were bullied, they were bullied, and then they lashed out. Okay, yeah. well, you know, even if someone has a diagnosis of Asperger's, the truth of the matter is they probably have gone through quite a bit of, uh, uh, you know, humiliation through their lives. And even if they haven't, uh, they have a very difficult time understanding that they haven't. They yeah. have a very hard time understanding that uh, things are fine and that they're not being mocked and that pe not everybody is making fun of them or laughing at them. And from their perspective, they are being bullied. And so really, it's there's uh, you know it's it's very difficult you have to see all sides of it having said that does anything ever justify so many young beautiful children uh, being yeah. taken from us no, no of, course of course not. not of course not and this is a tragedy it's a yeah. huge tragedy well and one of the things that a lot of people are saying about that uh, Washington Post article with the incendiary title is that if you read further down uh, even though they quote different numbers and they look back at a certain number of cases in the last 10 years of where there have been mass uh, murderers uh, one of the things that they say further on is that the thing that they all have in common, whether they're on the spectrum or not, is that those people had a psychosocial stressor, mm -hmm. that something had happened. That and yet that it. is buried way at the back of the article. What got the headline is uh, autism and mass murders. Really irresponsible, in my opinion. But You uh, know, Shana, the thing is that all sociopaths are all individuals who are who live outside of the normal social r rules, mm -hmm. uh, which is what we call sociopathic behavior, yeah. right? It's someone who normal social rules doesn't apply to, they don't see, understand the rules, will behave in ways that are erratic and not, not comprehensible for us. And that's what happened in this case as well. Yeah. Uh, this was a young man who felt that he would, that it would justify things if he did this. Yeah. That it would that it would be somehow retribution, as he called it. Yeah. You know, retribution for what? It yeah. just makes so no sad. sense. And I will say, you know, I got a couple of phone calls over the weekend of uh, parents of you know uh, kids that my son plays with, and and they were very polite about it. But they said, you know, are you reading the headlines? Are you seeing what's happening? What's your take on it? I want to get your take on it, which I thought was a really good way of them dealing with it because I knew that they had fears. And what I said was, you know, when we think back to when I was a kid, there were a bunch of shootings. There were three different shootings when I was a child that happened that were postal workers.
And I said, but we don't sit and say all postal workers are dangerous. That's right. That's we looked exactly at, right. We looked at what was happening that was causing a stressor that made postal workers Obviously, you know, they were in a situation where something point. could happen, right. but there were three postal workers that did this. We did we never said, I'm afraid of my mailman. Right. Right? Such and we need great, to have the same kind perfect. of mentality. That's right. That's a, but ha having said that, though, we did coin the term going postal yes. after that. Yes. So, you know, people have the tendency to do those things. but. You bring up a very good point, which is we have to identify, I mean, if anything good can come of this, it has to be that we identify those individuals in society that need help Yes. and figure out there are no programs for in kids on the spectrum, let's say Asperger's kids. They're, they're very little. I mean, we do these programs at CARD and we're overwhelmed with the need, but there's still very little out there for uh, very, very high level people who need help. Yeah, and that has to change, and that, that comes from all of us. We yes. have to be the loud voices to make that happen. We're going to take a short break, and then we're going to take a turn here and start answering your questions that you guys have been writing in, so stick with us. Welcome back to Smarty. This month we're going to be making a mandala. Mandala, you ask? What's that? Well, in Sanskrit, that means circle. And you'll see what I mean in just a moment. Okay, the materials you'd be needing for this project are colored paper, scissors, and glue. I'm assuming a lot of you guys have made paper snowflakes before. Well, this is the same idea except for we're going to be doing it with A, lots of color, and then B, we're going to be layering it up. So first step we're going to have to do is fold a piece of paper so when we cut it out there's going to be a repeating pattern on it. So what you're going to do is fold it in half and then you're going to fold it in half again. Make sure your lines are super creased, okay? And you're going to keep doing this. You're going to keep folding it in half as many times as you can possibly fold your paper. So now that this is folded in half as many times as I physically can fold it, I'm going to take my scissors and I'm going to cut out the excess. So here's the paper with all the excess cut off. If I open it up, boom, it's a circle, but it's missing all the wonderful patterns in here that repeat. So let's fold it back up and what we're going to do now is we're going to cut the shapes in it, kind of like a snowflake. So get creative here. Remember, don't go all the way through or else you're going to just cut in half. So, have fun with it. Okay, since my paper is, as you saw earlier, double-sided with different colors, I'm gonna cut out the center part and I'm gonna flip it. I know that sounds crazy, but you'll see what I mean in a second. All right, so let's open this up and take a look at it. Ooh, so you see that? I've got a perfect circle with a repeating pattern, exactly what I wanted. All right, so I've cut out the center part that I cut out for my whole circle open it up. Look at that. It's another circle, but it's smaller. I'm going to take this and place this in the inside. So the basic idea of the mandala is you're going to take your construction paper, fold it like I just showed you, and then cut different sized triangles, which will turn into circles, so there'll be layers of colors with the pattern. And of course, while you're doing this, you can talk about colors and have them work on their cutting skills. So now that I've cut out several snowflakes, I am going to start gluing them down on a piece of paper. Here's my mandala. It looks pretty finished, and it can be. But if you have an older kid and you really, really want to hone in on working on pattern making, you can take this little scrap piece that you cut out and have them add to the pattern themselves. Well, I hope you and your child enjoyed this project and learned a lot from it. Until next time, guys, craft on. Can you see me flying by your side? Welcome back to Autism Live. We're here with Dr. Doreen Grampache for Ask Dr. Doreen, and she's answering your questions. So we're going to get right to another question. Uh, somebody wrote this in yesterday. They loved the show yesterday. Thank you for that. Uh, this is a question uh, for tomorrow, which is today. Uh, you uh, are you able to get an update on the release of Skills book for the regular for the regulars who use Skills? I'm so excited and can't wait to use it. Uh, and they left their email address, and they said thank you so much. By the way, whenever you want 
us to get back to you, that's a great thing to do. Leave your email address and we don't share it. Um, but do we that's have an terrific. update? We will we'll, uh, forward your email to our clinical director, Evelyn Kong, who is right now the one rolling out Skillsbook. Thank you, first of all, for appreciating Skillsbook. I and skills. I am so like ugh, overwhelmed with joy that we are rolling out skills book this year. So we're in phase one and phase one involves the behavioral portion. So we have rolled out internally to card the behavioral portion of skills book, which is the portion that tracks challenging behaviors and automatically feeds them into the uh, multidisciplinary timeline into wow. skills. Um, I would say by, where are we? We're not, we're good. This is before the summer now. So I would say probably by the end of the summer, beginning of fall, we will roll out in its entirety within CARD. So the, all the discrete, all the data, natural environment and discrete trial data input. Uh -huh. So by the end of the year, then I'm thinking it'll probably go public, or okay. we'll send it out there for everyone else. So we we use we like to put, uh, you try things out on card first because it gives us the opportunity to fix problems, right. and that's what we're doing right now. Love it. So that by the time we send it out there, it should be pretty clean. Um, it is. Terrific, and you know, I I will. I'm still changing and adding stuff to it. I mean, I'm still, we're still working on. If I have a moment, I, I'm still working on uh, generating better graphs and reports and stuff. But even right now, it generates a ton of amazing stuff. It's so it's exciting when you think about all the different ways that people are going to be able to use this. And I, I, if you are somebody who works in a school, uh, I can see how that can revolutionize the way a team works at school right uh, because and it's time saving it's yeah. so amazing our therapists are you know initially people become like very reactive to new technology yeah. but our therapists I think are really enjoying it I mean people are shocked like within our own system they're like so I don't have to input behavior anymore I'm like no it automatically captures now off your iPad so wow. it's really nice truly really remar yeah. remarkable looking forward to it and thank you for the question okay uh, next question how do you work on getting them to talk about things other than what they're obsessed about. I'm grateful he's <laughs> talking, but I don't want to talk about Minecraft all day. Oh, sister, are we related? <laughs> uh, because I feel you on this one. So, Dr. Grandpache, how do we get them to talk about things that they're not oh, yeah. preferred topics? Right, right. I mean, and, and let me just uh, join the Minecraft thing here. <laughs> my son, as you know, is, is became the guru of Minecraft. So, um, it, like anything else, you why don't you just use a timer? Okay. And you know, first, teacher child um, when, to identify when they're talking about something that they only they are interested in. So, for instance, you make a list and you'll say, "So, tell me some of the things things you like to talk about." Minecraft, what else? List them, right? And then some of the things I might like to talk about, and that might be in itself a difficult task for your child because of the lack of theory of mind. Mm -hmm. Don't know. Uh, so you help your child identify those things, right? And you list those. And then you actually set a timer, and then you say, hey, let's just talk. And your child starts to talk, and you, you will you'll time uh, how whenever he's talking about one of the subjects on his list versus yours which most likely will start out with nothing on yours. Mm -hmm. And so you'll stop him and you'll say, look, um, you know, we have to have like an equal amount of time. Mm -hmm. So we've talked this much, like, you know, I don't know, one and a half minutes about your stuff. So now it's time to talk about my stuff, something off of my list. Mm -hmm. So let's do that. And then you do it and the timer goes off and you'll be like, oh, great. Now we can talk another minute and a half or three minutes about something on your list. You mm -hmm. pick it. And that's how you practice it. And it seems kind of rote initially, but believe me, your child will start to become aware of the fact that, oh, I've been talking about my own issue. I should probably talk so about something that they're interested in. Then it's a fabulous opening to teaching stuff like, well, ask me what are some things like, so that when he goes to other children, he's able to identify what are the things they're interested in. Yeah. 
and that gives you the opportunity to teach inferences it, it gives you the opportunity to teach the child to read facial expression mm -hmm. you know and you can actually then go more advanced and start to pretend like you're bored or something like that so he learns to m minimize the amount of time on minecraft and to realize oh she looks like she's bored maybe i should shorten and go to her subject there's so much stuff you can teach from that point forward i love this idea though of the visual of the two sheets of paper because i've been doing a thing with jem where i'll say to him uh you know you can talk you can tell me three things about a video game mm -hmm. and that's it mm -hmm. and then we're done mm -hmm. for the next hour mm -hmm. and and that was very effective at stopping the endless minecraft conversation but we end up doing that over and over and we don't ever progress past that mm -hmm. but i love the idea of the visual so that he can see right. the, the equality in it yeah, there's, I think there's an aspect of seeing the equality in it. Yeah, you have to balance it because it's not, and, and there's more than that. It's, it's about the child beginning to see past himself. Yeah. See, with our kids, they grow up and we're very, you know, the better trained a therapist you become as a mom, mm -hmm. you become more and more, you uh, sort of, you allow the child more and more um, it's it's egocentric like you are paying so much attention to his issues and at some point you really need to teach the child to pay attention to your issues and so that is a huge lesson and that comes with the whole theory of mind empathy everything and this you know being able to put them side by side is the very beginning of I took care of you you have to take care of me you have to give me equal coverage yeah. but you should go it goes a little bit further and it's more about teaching the child to kind of recognize that they're not being a good friend if they're not taking care of you and that produces the whole cycle of how how should i treat this other person how do i like to be treated yeah so so important uh i love all the ramifications from this that we get so important that because i think a lot of times we can poo poo and go oh well i'll just let them go on but it really is not a service to them if we do right. that and if you go on skills if you are a skills user in in the i believe this would be in the i'm not sure i'm thinking it's in the social curriculum but i'm not sure i think this falls under social conversation but this these whole all the lessons i just mentioned are in skills okay. um i don't know if we have it in the visual form format I said but exchanging communication or all that sort of stuff is in skills and you can uh, you know um, just staying on topic or ex yeah. changing topic paying attention to the ind other individuals facial expression all that sort of stuff is there yeah really remarkable that social language curriculum is insanely it's wonderful it's good stuff it's yeah. great for anybody to read through I learn I'm still learning things from it who am I kidding I learned past tense I'm learning from it <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, long Longer question. My son is five years and ten months old. He recently became obsessed with looking out the windows, mainly watching cars coming and going from our neighborhood. This happened before, and unfortunately, I did not get a chance to take data on it, but it did eventually fade and then go away completely. Now it's back. We did an FBA. It's definitely automatic reinforced. Last time we did a lot of blocking, but this time around, when it started back up, we just let him do it because it's not hurting anyone. My question is, sh should I continue to let him do it? It's only happening at home, and besides him not requesting to open the blinds or curtains, it's normally not a problem. On occasion, he will have meltdowns when certain cars leave the area screaming, black car, time to go bye-bye, while moving towards our front door and attempting to leave. Him requesting is an easy fix, and we are fading our prompts. Now he is almost independently requesting to look out the window. So interesting, it's kind of right? Cute. Yeah. I mean, to me, if he's. Uh, to me, he seems bored. To me, it seems like this is something that's of interest to him and he's almost interacting with it. Uh, you know, he's kind of curious about what's going on out there. I don't know if he has enough activity inside. So. I guess the, the few things that I would point out about this is that make sure 
I, I would probably leave it alone as long as it doesn't increase in time. So in other words, limit it to a certain healthy time frame. Like you don't want your child looking out the window at cars for half an hour every day or an hour every day. It's okay if they do it in two 15 minute segments, I suppose, but not if it's like a straight half hour where they won't do anything else. Make sure the child doesn't become rigid in terms of avoiding everything else when they're doing this. So like, make sure you can interrupt it by saying okay it's time to go now or if he starts to freak out because you're interrupting it then you realize that it's becoming a little bit too addictive or a little bit too intense for him and that's when you need to start intervening so just keep it at a healthy level now that aside why is he doing this you know when we say you've done an fba and it shows that it's automatic reinforcement basically means he's enjoying it internally okay he's enjoying it internally but why like what aspect of it is interactive for him or is entertaining mm -hmm. um i just feel like he has a certain level of boredom maybe he's into cars if he's into cars why not use this as an opportunity to you know get him to watch other uh car type shows or uh, you know, maybe he can look at cars online and learn about them, or uh, maybe you can have pretend play activities that involve cars, or, um, you know, if he's, hey, great, he's using uh, his, his colors when it comes to cars, maybe he can describe cars and through that learn a lot more attributes. You know, so there's, take the positives, absolutely, but just make sure that you're limiting it so that it doesn't start to become an obsessive behavior. Okay, can, you, can I tell you what I'm worried about? Yes, The please. sentence that she says, on occasion he will have meltdowns when certain cars leave the area screaming, black car, time to go bye-bye, <laughs> while moving towards our front door and mm -hmm. attempting to leave. Yes, That's good the point. part that worries me. Because, and I, and of course, I'm curious why, you know, what's, why is it the black car leaving and he says time to go bye-bye? Like, he wants to go bye-bye with that car. But does it say the car is leaving? The, it looks like the, the, the car, she says, is leaving the area. So if a oh, car yeah. is leaving the neighborhood, then he thinks it's time to go and is going to the door. Right. And, so and he's five, almost six, so at some point he's going to be able to get that door open, I'm worried. Yes. So, of course, that's a safety issue and you need to be very very careful with that secondly you need to i mean clearly he's exhibiting some sort of anxiety about the car leaving uh, which i think is a great opportunity for you to actually teach him that cars come and go and that there's a world of cars and you can do that with toy cars obviously you know that you can show him that black car is going bye-bye but then another black car will come you know that sort of thing uh, but as i said you need to be very very cautious that he's not opening the door and running after the car yeah. um, you also do need to teach him the the danger in cars so that you know if he has access to a car and if he's in love with cars he doesn't he realizes that he can't run in front of them or something yeah. All of those are, are given facts, but uh, again, so everything has two sides to it. Yeah. As long as it doesn't become obsessive or dangerous, um, then you can take his interest in cars and develop it into other things. And, and I hope you make sure that you get a really good high lock on that door that he can't open because if he's that interested in it, I want to make sure that he can't get out. Well, yeah, and I don't know, you know, the problem with locks, of, obviously, is that a lot of times people... Forget. Forget, yeah, right? It's human error. Right. I mean, I think you can definitely have the whole handle moved up all the way up so that he's not reaching it right now. So the whole, the whole you know, gizmo is up high uh -huh. on top. But they have these very good devices now that are automatically on the door that'll beep if the door's open. Right, the little alarms. And yeah, they're fairly it's inexpensive. Just a little box. Yeah, yeah, very inexpensive. I think they're less than $20. And yeah. it's a little box like that, and you put it on the door, and it will beep when it's open. So it's sort of a magnetic yeah. uh, contact. And that's a perfect way as well of tracking things. And But you, you also want to teach him. I mean, you yeah. have to teach him, not just prevent it, but teach him that he can see those things and that he shouldn't run after them. And I think the running after it is is his anxiety that this car is leaving and he will never see it again and i think you need to teach him that there are many cars coming and so on and so forth like use the the anxiety to actually figure out how to calm him down what is it that's causing him anxiety i was really struck by something last night i, I mentioned we, i went to the unified theater performance last night we mm -hmm. had them on the show yesterday and wyatt was in the performance and it was so lovely to go and see and the kids were great and what a wonderful program so impressive but there was something that happened shortly after 
after the show started that was just so interesting to me on my street where I live. Um, there was a, a small baby who was in the audience mm -hmm. who was fine as we're waiting for the, the lights to go down. The lights went down, baby is fine. The kids start to come out on the stage and they're starting to talk and the baby starts to fuss. And the mom is, you know, trying everything. And it's a, a child that's just basically been walking for a couple of months. And she's, you know, trying to keep the baby quiet because, you know, mm -hmm. what, and the baby is fussing and, uh, uh, you know, and wants to go. And finally she went and sat in the aisle and was trying to, and the baby wa was not having any of it and made so much noise that finally the mom left the theater. Mm -hmm. And eventually at some point she sneaked in a, a little bit later and there was a part at the end of the show where they had all the kids who were in the show come and sit on the stage and they showed a beautiful slideshow that was like the curtain call of the process that they had gone through and it was amazing and it was wonderful and they had live music to play during it and but at some point the mom came back in with the baby and the baby walked out into the middle of the stage and was just the happiest child. she wanted to be on the stage with those kids because her sister was on there oh, and it didn't matter we didn't know that in the audience it right, could have been that right, she wanted right, a drink right, it could right, have been right. that she didn't like being in the dark right. uh, but then once you saw that baby on the stage she was thrilled and as they were going around and giving flowers to each one of the kids the baby went over and held its hand out like it's my turn and her body language was and then she went over and wanted to take the microphone this was a child who wanted to be there in the mix right but it would have been all too easy for us to misread it and say oh the baby just can't hang for the performance not at all right she was fine to be in the <laughs> she, yeah. yeah once she but you know and it really reminded me about until our kids have functional communication to we don't tell know. us what they want right right uh, but it, it is so like when they're babies it's just like when they're babies i mean your child does something i with my kids i know i would sit there and i'd give a million options i'd be like yes black car bye bye or yeah. but what so what another car is coming back and i'd keep talking until i'd f see my child's reaction change and then kind of like oh okay and i think we just we can't make assumptions right. we have to recognize that our children are behaving the way they are for some reason yeah they're trying exactly. to tell us something you know yeah. and, and it's important to try to figure out what that is yeah yeah because in the meantime especially whenever we look at elopement and wandering that a lot of not all the time sometimes it's get to get away from something but sometimes it's to go to something definitely it's to to go after something because they like the way it looks or is or they don't want it to disappear or they don't have the concept of object permanence that something's gone but it's not gone for good you know right. it's just it's still right. permanent it's there and those types of things are very very important because they can be pretty disturbing i yeah. mean this is like what leads to kids who have separation anxiety they think when their mom walks away she's gone for good yeah. the concept of i will see her again in 10 minutes doesn't exist and you know you should teach your child those things that will help them calm down quite a bit They've written in some more. She says, my son right. picks that same black car because it's the same not make model as my car. He is also obsessed with another car that is navy blue that is the same not model of my car. Even though our cars look different, he has managed to figure out that they are all the same make. Interesting. Interesting. Same make, not model. I see. So it's the same t same type of car, but not the same model of the car. Interesting. Right. So this is what I love about our kids. So like it's a Honda or something, right. or like it's a Mercedes or whatever it is. And so basically your child is, that's very interesting. That could mean a lot of different things. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm wondering if you were, first of all, I have so many thoughts. I love our kids. They're so fascinating. <laughs> They're just so fascinating. And someday you're going to be able to look back and talk about this and, and hopefully know. Know exactly uh, what it and, is. And he'll be able to tell you. But until then. Absolutely. So first of all, so clearly your child is one of those kids who memorizes very interesting facts. So, you know, get him engaged in other aspects of sorting. This is basically sorting. You know, these are all Mercedes, these are all Hondas, these are all whatever, Toyotas mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And that's cool. That's an activity. And it's actually a cool activity for later in life. Mm -hmm. Like I can see my son now who's 15 and all of his buddies, it's all about cars, right? Because right? they're at right. the age where they're getting cars and everybody, my son knows I throw out a name, he'll know exactly what year, model, whatever it is, you know, it's yeah. crazy. So, um, so that's an activity that your child could engage in separately. The fact that it's the same make, 
um, as your car. I don't know if he's artistic. Does he like the logo? Is that what's attracting him? Or is it simply that it is your car? Does he panic because he thinks your car is leaving? I don't know. There's so many different... Are you there when he panics like that? Yeah. Uh, has the car? Has your car ever been driven away with you at home? Like, right, and, and what, right. what attached that happened? Right, you know? right. Did he miss out on something because There's, the car drove away right. once? You wonder. There, there is a reason, though, that, that would make sense to us, mm -hmm. that he's sort of trying to uh, go. It could be something as simple as a puzzle piece is missing now, mm -hmm. because all the cars with this particular make are in the neighborhood, and all is fine, and now it's gone, and there's an empty hole there. Right. It could be something as simple as that. You really do need to find out though what it is because you need to be able to teach him that it's okay. Right. So that he doesn't try to run after it. Right. You know, and that's very important. So fascinating. Our kids are complicated. But but they're a beautiful mystery too. Oh yeah. Absolutely. And and when you find the answer to it, it's uh, usually it's shocking. Huge awesome. light bulb. Yeah, yeah. You go. Oh, okay. So that's what was going on. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah. All right. Let's short break, and then we're going to come back with more of your questions. Stick with us. Hello, activist. Let's talk about step eight. State your intention. Conceive it. Believe it. Achieve it. Author Napoleon Hill wrote that 100 years ago. The Power of Positive Thinking. Norman Vincent Peale wrote that 60 years ago. See, practicing positive focused thought has been around a long time, long before The Secret came about. That's because practicing positive focused thinking really works. Think about when you drive somewhere in your car. You don't just go around in circles. You have a destination, right? I mean, sure. There's going to be speed bumps and detours along the way, but you know where you're going. State what you want to achieve. Say it aloud, write it down. I have post-its on my computer. One says, get Wyatt all the treatment and therapy he needs to reach his full potential. Step two, help other families. The focus part is really important because I realize that in this lifetime, I'm not going to be elected president or become a rock star. But I'm doing okay on those first two steps. Live in a state of knowing you will reach your goals for you and your child. Until next time, keep the faith. Welcome back. And there was the great Nancy Allspot Jackson, who won't be joining us uh, today, but uh, she is recuperating from a fall. She is okay. Want everybody to know that, but she needs to be horizontal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're going to we're going to staple all. her to the bed. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> she, well, yes. But uh, she, like you, that you're both Energizer bunnies, and occasionally, you know, we just need to pull the batteries out and say, "Go to bed," yeah, and stay in bed. So, Nancy, you you are not allowed. To to come here uh, and, and you feel need to get better well. get well and soon. please feel better and she is i know already feeling better uh okay so next uh question we actually had another follow-up uh, that, uh, yes, he runs to the cars when we go out. He stares at the logo on the car. Mm -hmm. So it's so, the logo. So, you know... And all the same logo, she's yeah, saying. Yeah, right, right, which is the make. So if he's into the logos, why don't you just get him into art? Like, get him into drawing these things and redirect it to something that's... Uh, functional adaptive yeah. and uh, you know have teach him have somebody teach him how to draw cars with different logos and or uh, you can have a very basic thing which is you know take a picture of the logo turn it into a sticker and when that car is gone he can replace it with this sticker yeah. until the car comes back or something like that give him like a monopoly board which has all these cars and he can draw them and put them there and I uh, give him a different out so this yeah. has to do with sort of a, la a, a lack of closure when one of the logos is gone or something. It's yeah. You can even take a piece of paper and put it over the logo and take a crayon so that he can right, get an impression right. of it. Right. And, well, or you, you know, can print it. Yeah, absolutely. You know? I mean, yeah. so many different ways to... Fascinating, though. Absolutely fascinating. Okay, another question. How much parent training do you presume to be included with any family's card program? How much parent training do you think... What was the exact question? Do How you, much parent training it, do you presume do you presume to, to be, be included? included in any family's card? Well, program? here, let's put it this way. Um, I would hope 
that it's a lot. Uh, whether or not it is, unfortunately, sometimes it gets watered down uh, because we are A, restricted by funding, B, restricted by time more than anything else because we have a set amount of time to use a set number of hours with your child. I would hope that it's huge. So one of the things that I've done now is um, we have two programs running. I mean, I've always ex uh, essentially, my, my, mis my own, uh, I guess, projection, because when I used to see kids and, and run clinics, I used to always make sure that my parents were trained on everything. They knew everything, every lingo, everything that was going on. They could sub in for a therapist, right? And I think that's usually very beneficial. Very, very beneficial. I want parents to be at the point of, of a therapist. Uh, and in fact, I'm doing a program soon where I will be offering to every parent at CARD to receive training to become the equivalent of a registered behavior technician, which was your idea, Yay. which was something you got me to do. Or you I'm so mentioned. excited. I'm about to do it. Okay, are you? Great. Yes, I am. Okay, I'm excited great. about it. Yeah, because you you mentioned that to me, and I thought, wait a minute, i got to get all our parents to do this. And I'd love to mandate it, but I'm not sure that I can. I'm going to try mm -hmm. to make sure that I'll, over the year, like a few years, I get all of our parents had an RBT level certification because I think it would be fabulous for parents. But in order to help parents along right now, we have two separate programs going. One is being Ali Aguilar is one of our old uh, uh, supervisors who I absolutely love. If you ever met her, uh, she's terrific. She's always been a very, very good supervisor. And for the last few years, because she had kids of her own, we allowed her to do project development. She did a lot of skills stuff mm -hmm. um, from home. And so now she's sort of being, starting to come back to some things and she's developing a, she's, let's say not developing, but starting, a, she's developing a, a platform by which we can enforce parent training for all of our ongoing parents, which would probably be the RBT model. Mm -hmm. And then Vince Redmond, as you know, now his position is to spend, I think, somewhere between 12 and 40 hours with every new family. So his uh, initial training will involve like getting the families acclimated to ABA autism, what they're supposed to be, just a better understanding of things overall. So, you know, we think that that will be a beginning thing and then we will have an ongoing thing. And I think if we can motivate our parents to get RBT trained, that would be the best. Yeah. But, you know, again, having said that, just because of the way the question is written, if I had to answer it accurately, I would say my presumption is that it is more than it, what it probably is. Because in reality, I think what happens to, to our staff, our supervisors, is that they're so time limited and they have so many things that they have to get done uh, for your funding sources mostly, uh, that they don't get to do all the things the way we'd love to do them. Yeah. And, and I, I would say too that while there's a great deal of training, depending on where you are, in the, in California, Regional Center requires you get 16 hours before you can even go to an ABA provider, any ABA provider. Uh, and, a, and a lot of times... I mean, other... that's, of course, not every regional center either. Oh, really? See, I thought it was across the board no, in California. No, North LA and oh, maybe a couple others. Regional centers are quite different. And then, of course, whoever provides the regional center training is different, too. Uh, yes. So, like, who did you get your training from? Was it someone at North LA or...? Yes. Mm -hmm. So now that it's being... Um, uh, handed out to other organizations, and some of those organizations are not that thrilling. Well, and and Sadly. even then, even then, that 16-hour training that came when you weren't experiencing it. So, if I had it to do over again, I would have been thrilled to have taken that like every During. year, yes, yes, so that I could learn more because then I got less tired because I got more sleep and I could learn better. And and I just want to say for the parents that are out there, whatever provider that you have that's giving you, let's say they're giving you two hours of training, that that whatever it is, you have a responsibility to do more mm -hmm. and you now have the ability to do more the RBT training is available to everybody but e there are so many other trainings that are on IBT yes. that it's available to you and you can make it child specific to your child but no 
you know, even if they mandate it and say you have to do this to have the funding, it's still on you. It's your yeah. responsibility to do it and learn it, and it's to your benefit, and it's to your child's benefit, right. and it's to the detriment if you don't. Well, yeah, and I think that you should just go on IBT. I mean, IBT is fabulous, and just go through those, through all of them. Go through the entire parent section, go through the entire teacher section, the professional section. Just learn as much as you can from that. That's They're very, very inexpensive and very possible to do. Once you've done, I mean, they're cheaper than buying a book, you know, yeah. so and once you've done that, you should then go for the RBT. The RBT is very different in that it involves, a, it's an assessment. So it's very, very individualized. So we, the, our people assess you and identify specifically your areas that you need to work on and learn and then teach you those particular things and make sure that you understand it in, a, in a very well-rounded manner of what it is that you're doing. And let me tell you, I don't have a language other than ABA when I deal with my own kids. I just don't because it's part of who I am. And not just my kids, my, my spouse, my entire life, right? I mean, it is all ABA. It changes you, uh, as I see in you, Shannon. <laughs> It, it I can't believe the you. things that come out of my mouth now. Right, and it changes I can't you in a wonderful way. Yes. It, things make a lot more sense, and you are much more empowered. Yes. Not just with your child, with your with your employer, with your friends, with your spouse, with, with daily problems. It, allow, it's, it helps you to understand things better. And it also forces you to see the good things. Absolutely. It does. And that's a lovely, lovely gift. Yes, yes honestly. definitely. One of the th promises that I got from the first family that told us about CARD, they said they will give you the best parenting training that you can get that's available that's anywhere awesome. in the world. That's right. And that's that's really true, but it, it goes far beyond parent training. It was life skills. Yeah. It really is. And, and I think you made a very good point. It's that it, it makes you so comfortable with your own child. You know, whereas before you're scared, should I do this, should I yeah. do that, who do I ask, what do I do? Right. And it, it empowers you to, it's like teaching you sign language for your child who's in, uh, hearing yeah. impaired. Yeah, it is You amazing. now know the language and can communicate and you know you have a tool that's effective when your child's screaming, you know what to do. Yeah. You know, I, I had so much fear and trepidation when we would go places about what was going to happen in public right, right. and could I handle it. Right. And I can remember there, where we live, they have concerts in the park every summer. And I remember going to those and saying to my husband, and you'd see kids that were just running in the field and having a good time. And, and I remember saying to my husband, will we ever get to the point where we can just let him do that? And I have that now. Mm -hmm. I have a happy, compliant child. Not a child that I've threatened into being compliant, although occasionally I do that too, because I slip sometimes. I, well, everybody does. <laughs> right? But I have, uh, and I get to enjoy him now. I yes. can't tell you how often I'm someplace and we're leaving. Right. Uh, even last night, going to the, the theater show, and there were times when, you know, a couple of things happened, and I'll talk about them in the next hour. But I, I got to enjoy my child. And right. I find that as we're walking back to the car or the house or whatever, that I find myself saying to him, I just so enjoy spending time with you. Right, right. And it's not because I've, I've been told that's a good thing to say. That's from the bottom of my soul saying it to him. Right. That's the best gift, because I didn't know if we were ever going to have that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But th that came from not just having therapists in the home, from me learning things. Absolutely. I mean, the therapists are very limited in their time with your child, in contrast to the amount of time you as a parent spend with your child. Yeah. So, but uh, so important, the parent training, and it's got to be ongoing, and the parents have to ask for more, and the parents have to schedule it. It's there. Right. right. You've given us the tools now. Back in my day, I would have had to go back to school. There wasn't a library that I could go park in and read everything that that you make available to us now and and you can start doing it for as little as seven dollars and fifty cents change right. your surroundings today right. for seven dollars right. and fifty cents exactly that's you know you can buy a, a, a starbucks you know grand day or whatever it's i don't true. drink coffee for for that amount of money right. so right. it's incredible and if you don't have it by the way if you don't have the money to be able to do it if seven dollars and fifty cents is outside because of all the other things that you have going on you can apply for a grant from Act today uh, to get those IBT trainings. So there is no one that shouldn't be able to do it. That's right. Uh, Emily, do we have time for one more question? Okay. How do you get a high functioning kiddo to make eye contact in stressful situations it hasn't generalized? Mm, that's a very broad question. 
because we define high stressful as different things. I guess I would um, try to gradually infuse the stressful components into the child's environment. So I'm thinking of it as I'm trying to infer what what the parent is expressing here. Um, for instance, we will teach certain things and then we want to make sure that our child is capable of doing those things in a classroom environment, okay. just as an example. And the classroom environment, generally, I don't consider it a stressful environment, but I do if the child is sensory, uh, you know, has difficulty with sensory input. So one of the things that I will do, for instance, is I'll tape record the sounds of a classroom and I will introduce the, those in the background of the child's room where we're doing one-to-one -one, mm -hmm. so that I'm able to kind of condition the child to be able to ignore those sounds and continue to focus. So whatever the stress impacting factors are, the things that you think are stressful mm -hmm. for your child, it could things that cause stress generally are things like uh, extreme sensory input, uh, timed, any activity that is timed will tend to produce stress for everyone. So in other words, if you're, with, if there's a timer and you have to finish within a certain period of time, that increases anxiety and stress. So whatever those factors are, I would gradually bring them into, uh, fade them in, shape them in, so the child's behavior shapes and gradually get, the child is exposed to these factors in a uh, kind of experimental setting mm -hmm. with gradual infusion rather than just throwing your child into the stressful situation. Okay. Uh, we had a follow-up on the, the question from the parent asking mm. about the card training. They want to know how does a parent get involved with this RBT. Oh, great. And they said that we are not in California, and they, they have said that they don't feel like they're getting any parent training. Okay. So I would uh, co contact IBT, Institute for Behavioral Training. So they are ibehavioraltraining.com. Right, uh, ibehavioraltraining.com. Or if you just put in Institute for Behavioral Training in Google, it'll come up. Yes. They are our training group. They are the group of supervisors who were here at CARD for 20 years and we cut them off and made their own company which is IBT and they are our most fantastic people and they will give you information about how to do RBT, the get the RBT certification because we do it with them but also and it doesn't matter where you are, I believe we can do it anywhere. Um, and yeah. also, they will, you know, just going on the IBT website, you can start downloading and getting some of those trainings. Okay. Uh, so, again, ibehavioraltraining.com. Check that out. All right. We are completely out of time, and I know you've got other things to do. Wonderful. I'm loath to let you go, well, but uh, so thrilled to have you, you here. And uh, we're, we're going to take a short break and go to the A Word. This is the ongoing documentary being made at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. It's following a little boy, Jack Riley, who was diagnosed with autism at the age of two, and now he's getting his intensive behavioral intervention, and we're a little ways into the series now so you can really see some of the benefits that he's having because of this. Now it doesn't mean that it's all hearts and flowers and roses and it certainly doesn't mean that the parents don't have a lot to learn along the way about what the therapists are doing and how they can get involved. So take a look. This is the A Word. Mike warns Jack Riley that he will be allowed to watch the duck song one time only. He does this so Jack Riley can anticipate what will happen once the song finishes. Transitions are difficult for him and others with autism because they have a hard time anticipating what comes next. Because of this, they have a hard time planning ahead and being flexible. These skills are considered executive functions. You guys have to watch this duck song. Oh my gosh! Oh, I got to turn the music. I got to turn the sound. And he said to the man running the stand, Hey! Got any grapes? The man said, Look, this is getting old. I mean, lemonade's all we've ever sold. Why not give it a go? The duck said, How about no? How about no? Then you waddle the way. Then you waddle the way. Then you waddle the way. Oh, 
Bye bye duck. Bye bye duck. Bye bye. Mm. No. Oh no. Bye no. bye duck. Later. Mm. You know, you know, anger is a cool thing at different mm. times, but not right now. Hey, we'll watch it. We'll watch it again later. Say bye bye duck. Bye bye duck. Bye bye duck. Say I'll miss you. I'm sad. I'm, uh, I'm sad. I'm sad. I'm sad. I'm sad. Okay. Learning how to transition is a life skill. Every day, one is constantly transitioning from one activity to the next, and he needs to cope with changes without tantrums and not be fixated on doing the same activity repetitively. Watching the duck song is incredibly reinforcing for him, and he needs something just as interesting to transition to. Hey, Jack, here's Dad waddle waddling. Waddle waddle. Waddle away, waddle waddle. Waddle away, waddle waddle. There you go. to help Jack Riley transition to the next activity is to count him down. He understands that once she reaches one, that the preferred idol will be taken away. No lollygagging. Five, four, three, two, one. one. Ready? Okay, toothbrushing. We're gonna go like this. Hey, that's not how we do it. Watch mommy. Can you do that? Do that. One, two, three! Yay! Good job! Yay, Zach Riley! Good, good job! Tall. That was pretty good. Five, four, three. <laughs> Sit down. Hi, buddy. Sit down. Three, two, one. Yes, I know you know. Okay, we're gonna go bottoms. Like that, okay? Ready? You can do it. One, two, three. Yay! You did it, Jack! Good, Good job. job! Good job, Jack. Jack Riley, okay. we're gonna say bye bye to Tazel. Are you ready? Can you give me Tazel? Five, four, three, Ow. two, one. Okay, give it to mommy, please. Good, Good boy. Job. I know it's hard, isn't it? Can you march back to mommy? March, 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 march. It's Lisa Ackerman, Talk of Facts, Autism Journey questions and answers that help you get down the path in your autism journey faster, easier, like the Superman that you need to be or Supergirl. Um, but on a serious note, one of the most common questions that I get um, is what do I do when my child is a non-responder to therapeutics and medical intervention? If you have a child that's a non-responder, know this, and if you've been on the journey for a long time, there's been more research in treatments for autism since 2005 than all previous years combined. 
So my first recommendation for a kid, um, for a family that has a kid with a non-responding issue to treatments, therapies, and medical intervention, is to reevaluate the treatments that are available. Start with the basics. Go back and revisit a MAPS doctor. Get all of that baseline testing or a good neuropsych if you need to look at the therapeutics. Start with the baseline. The second thing families need to know when they are um, dealing with a child that has non-responder issues is really you're going to have to scale up and I mean scale up the time you're spending with your resources to figure out and really become the Sherlock Holmes to understand what is going on, what is impeding progress, why aren't things moving forward. You really need to make sure that you have a current MRI and a current EEG. Those two tests are so extremely valuable, often they will provide clues as to what is going on and what treatments that really could help your child make the best progress they can make. Hey, there's another frequently asked question. Wish I had my magic fairy wand so everybody was a responder. It's in the shop. Um, maybe I'll get it next time when we get together and talk about Taka Facts. We'll see you soon. Welcome to Let's Talk to See. I'm, I'm sad to report that my wonderful cohort, Nancy Allspa Jackson, is not with me today, but I'm happy to report that she's okay. She, as we reported earlier, took a spill on Friday night, Saturday morning, and she bonked her head. Miss Lucy bonked her head, but she is fine and she will be fine. She just needs to get some rest. So if she's watching, Nancy, we love you and we miss you, but get some rest. But she will be fine. I uh, also have some sad news to report at the start of the show today. If you haven't heard already, Miss Maya Angelou passed away this morning. And oh, can I tell you, I was so sad to hear that. And uh, she's somebody that I frequently quote. Just yesterday, I was quoting her to somebody and saying, you know what Maya Angelou says. Uh, and if you have not read I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, I must tell you it's required reading. You must, you must. Uh, so throughout the show today, I just want to share some quotes from her. I want to start with a lengthy one. This is from Maya, Miss Maya. I've learned that no matter what happens or how bad it seems today, life does go on and it will be better tomorrow. I've learned that you can tell a lot about a person by the way he or she handles these three things, a rainy day, lost luggage, and tangled Christmas tree lights. I've learned that regardless of your relationship with your parents, you'll miss them when they're gone from your life. I've learned that making a living is not the same thing as making a life. I've learned that life sometimes gives you a second chance. I've learned that you shouldn't go through life without a catcher's mitt on both hands. With, with a catcher's mitt, excuse me, on both hands, you need to be able to throw something back. I've learned that whenever I decide something with an open heart, I'm usually making the right decision. I've learned that even when I have pains, I don't have to be one. I've learned that every day you should reach out and touch someone. People love a warm hug or people love just a friendly pat on the back. I've learned that I still have a lot to learn. I've learned that people for, will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Amazing, amazing woman. Uh, so, Miss Maya Angelou, you will be horribly, horribly missed. And throughout the show today, I'm going to pepper it with Maya quotes. The rest of them shorter than that one, but it's a it's a beauty. I uh, want to start with a little in the news. And by the way, in just a little while, when we take the first break, uh, we're going to bring in we're we're going to be joined by a fabulous guest, Miss Elaine Hall. Coach E is going to be with us talking about the Miracle Project. She uh, was instrumental. The, the driving force behind Autism the Musical, and she's got some really great news for us about things that are happening with the Miracle Project, including a grant from the NEA, so really remarkable. But first, a couple of stories in the news that uh, we thought you might want to know. Uh, Nature Magazine is reporting that mice with mohawks are helping scientists to study autism. Uh, did I say mohawks? Yes, I did. Uh, because they're finding that there are some mice that will engage in over-grooming. And when they do that, they, they rub themselves and rub themselves to the point that they uh, give themselves a mohawk. And so they've taken those mice and they've been able to isolate a gene in which they can see that that gene is causing
causing this behavior and they're able to affect change to see what can stop the behavior those obsessive kinds of behavior so fascinating new study here study um, coming out of New York University um, and they it says that researchers discovered that genetically knocking out production of a protein called CNTNAP4 a protein usually found uh, uh, excuse me a protein found in usually unusually low levels in the over grooming mice uh, affected two highly specialized neurotransmitters in the brain gamma <laughs> gamma am, where is Nancy when I need her to say these things for me GABA essentially and dopamine so I'm going to try to say it gamma anambutric acid but GABA GABA is uh, a supplement that often people on the autism spectrum will give their children that uh, reports to help with focus being able to pay attention and of course we've all heard of dopamine uh, and it goes on to say that GABA helps control brain impulses and regulate motor action while dopamine is the hormonal stimulant that produces pleasing sensations in animals without the protein GBA signaling is suppressed while dopamine over stimulates the brain the new nyu team exposed young mice with healthy cntnap4 proteins to adult mice both with and without the protein those who lacked the protein groomed the young mice until they sported the mohawk like hairdos while the genetically healthy mice did not uh i, I hope they test uh parents who are helicopter parents as well i think i need this test uh anyway the the results they say will better help them to identify the genetic route of the autistic behavior they are quoted as saying there have been many candidate genes implicated in, con uh, in con contributing to autism, but animal and human studies to identify their action have so far not led to any therapies. Our research suggests that reversing the disease's effects and signaling pathways with GABA and dopamine are potential treatment options. Really quite remarkable. And that, of course, is from Dr. Jordan Fishell. Uh, and he is from the NYU study. Really remarkable. Now, in some other interesting news, the FBI has uh, created a, a simulation program for in-house for the FBI, but it is now being used with some benefit for autistic individuals in order to help them to prepare for for jobs. Uh, a lot of times our adults have trouble talking about themselves and interacting socially, which is a skill that's really important in a job interview. And often they're being bypassed for the interview because they can't get over that hump. Well, this FBI simulation program uh, is, uh, it, it simulates an interaction and helps give that immediate feedback. It's, uh, again, based on software originally used in FBI to train adults to improve their job interview skills with confidence and they're now using it with adults and seeing that they are getting better at these skills it's pretty remarkable uh, the quote is adults with an autism spectrum disorder tend to have difficulties with social communication which may interfere with them having a su successful job interview this is from the lead study author Matthew J Smith he is a research assistant professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Northwestern University the Feinberg School of Medicine our program helps trainees to learn to talk about their ability to work as a team member so they sound easy to work with they also learn how to sound interested and enthusiastic about a potential job as well as convey that they are a hard worker uh, the study was published in the journal of autism and developmental disorders uh, and it really couldn't come at a better time because the employment rate for individuals who are on the autism spectrum is at an all-time uh, uh, unemployment is at an all-time high. Employment is at an all-time low. Uh, and they go on to say that approximately 50,000 individuals with autism turn 18 every year. That's a lot of people looking for a job. And their further quote is, we hope that this training program can improve the employment potential for per persons with autism spectrum disorder. Many people with this disorder would like to work but have trouble actually getting the job. And we know once they get the job that they are able to do a spectacular job in most instances. So love that. Love that we're using something that came from the FBI. Uh, also wanted to draw a little bit of attention to, you know, we talk here on the show quite a bit about
about self-funded plans and uh, the fact that self-funded plans currently under the, the federal legislation that exists right now, they, they're housed under something called ERISA laws. And that set of laws is outside of what we've come to know and understand the Affordable Care Act, or as some people call it, Obamacare. And so you may have a mandate in your state, but you have an employer who has a self-funded plan, and so you may not have insurance uh, for autism coverage. We're seeing more and more companies taking the right step and deciding now, before there's a federal mandate, that they should cover it. Uh, but there are many companies that don't, and, um, you know, I recently, I don't know why it suddenly got a lot of attention, but my husband has worked for Whole Foods for many, 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 many years, and and that has been our primary ins uh, source of insurance through all that we went through with autism. And it, uh, of course, you know, back in those days, nobody was covering it. And so Whole Foods was no different than anyone else, right? But now that's not the case. Uh, that's certainly not the case. There are many self-funded plans that are making the choice to follow what these state mandates are and to uh, cover, cover the really essential care for autism and include ABA in that. It's one of the 10 essential health benefits as outlined in the Affordable Care Act, so there's great reason to expect that it should be covered. Um, but many employers are still holding out, and Whole Foods is a big one. And I know this from personal experience that they are not covering it. Um, and I have been quoted very loudly and widely saying that while Whole Foods is a wonderful employer in a lot of different ways, this is a very severe black mark. If you want to see some of those articles, there, there, there are at least two of them that are out there circulating, quoting me, talking about Whole Foods. Uh, and if you have an employer that you work for that is a big company such as Whole Foods that enjoys the pleasure of being thought of as somebody who's compassionate and caring and pro-autism, and yet they're not covering your insurance, please write in and tell us, because I think that people need to know that. People need to be aware, and these companies need to know that we're looking and that we're watching. And I, you know, I've put in a call to Whole Foods and said to them, do you want to talk about this in a way that is not out in the press? I'll be happy to talk about it. And, you know, they're not returning my calls. Um, I, I welcome them if they they want to come into my home, they want to interview me. The truth of the matter is, is that my son doesn't need very much at all right now in the in the manner of autism services. It's a reality. He's doing very well. And that's not why I am speaking out at this point about it. I'm speaking out about it for all the families that are coming behind us. And and I I feel that our companies need to do the right thing. And of course, we're, we're speaking out to our legislators and begging them to please not give the option to the employers. Uh, you know, let's get a federal mandate on the books, shall we? I uh, also want to let you know, uh, we've been talking about this a little bit, that the Combating Autism Reauthorization Act of 2014 is a very hot topic right now. There's a bipartisan bill guiding how the federal government will respond to autism over the next five years, and it's just been introduced to Congress. The Combating Autism Reauthorization Act of 2014 would continue vital research Research, prevalence monitoring and professional training, but Congress needs to act and they have until September 30th or the current law will expire. So you need to make sure, we talked to you yesterday about signing up for Autism Votes to get uh, messages if you want to do that, but whatever you do, your member of Congress uh, needs to be aware of the fact that you are supporting them to pass this law. And if you think, oh, they're just going to do it and, and it's just going to happen and you decide not to write, you will be part of a group of people who have their heads buried in the sand. We need to make sure it's like matchsticks, right? You know, we want to create a bonfire and it depends on how many little matchsticks will get on this fire, how much heat will give off. We need a bonfire. And I've seen this happen all too often. If, if enough people don't respond, then and our legislators think that it's not a hot button issue. And unfortunately, that is what drives them. Hot button issues. Let's make this hotter than you know what. Make sure that they feel it. Let's get this passed and let's make sure that we set ourselves up so that, look, it will help with other things too. If we put enough heat 
uh, still working that metaphor. If we put enough heat on this, then they see how big of a population we are, and it will help with other legislation. The Combating Autism Reauthorization Act of 2014, you can go to Autism Votes and find out who your congressperson is. you be given their phone number. And, you know, uh, Shelley Hendricks asked us to advocate for five minutes a day. Call once a day. Seriously. You know, I, I'm learning. That's what we have to do. Nancy always says, be a dog on a pork chop. Let's be a dog on a pork chop. Okay, we are going to take a break, and then when we come back, we're going to be joined by Elaine Hall from The Miracle Project. You're going to love what she has to say. Stick with us. When you find out you're having a boy, you always think, like, oh, he's going to play football, he's going to do this and that. And then when he's diagnosed, all those things get washed away. It's like that piece that's always in the back of your mind, you know, where is he, what is he doing, is he safe? We really didn't know what we were dealing with. I wish that they could have directed me a little bit more and provided me some information. I was a young mom. I didn't know what it was like to raise a boy despite a boy with autism. Hundreds of thousands of families are not getting the help they need for their children with autism all around the country. Act Today is determined to bridge the gap. These families really have to go through a lot to get a grant. The application process isn't easy. The records, the diagnosis proof, they're really battling for their kids. So when we can give them a grant, it is so wonderful to see that they succeed in getting that help for their children. Our founder, Dr. Doreen Grampiche, is an amazing woman. And she is one of the world's foremost authority on behavior of children with autism. She's extremely knowledgeable and she oversees every single grant we give. She is part of that process. People may think of autism care and treatment as simply schooling or therapy, but you know, we provide important safety supports, things like fencing, for example. The whole family is living in fear of that child running out into traffic. I recently delivered an iPad to a little boy with some of the apps that are out there for children with autism. Miracles happen. I got the iPad from ACT. From ACT, What yeah. did it say? Can you repeat that, Dustin? I got the iPad from that. We have helped so many military families. And when I think of these brave families that are fighting two battles, one to protect our country and one for the right treatment and care for their children, it, it breaks my heart. And I think we have to do more as a nation to help them. There's not a day that doesn't go by that we don't think about it. Some people say, oh, he's normal. You don't see the battles that I see every single day. My husband does have to deploy, and when they get on that bus, that might be the last time that my kids ever see them. So I called, and then they informed me that he had received the grant, which was like a blessing from above. I was just like speechless. I just started to cry because, you know, without it, we would, we would have been lost. The AT grant was a total miracle, and without that, they wouldn't be able to receive a service dog, so we're so appreciative of what they've done for us as a family. Recently, ACT Today funded a program for military children with autism in San Diego, the Inclusion Films program, which is run by Joey Travolta, and teaches uh, kids on the autism spectrum literal filmmaking skills. They learn how to make a movie. Are we ready? There you go, got it. Okay. Everything that goes into the process of making a film goes into everyday life. So they're learning life skills, they're learning to collaborate. It was really nice to know how much they were enjoying this camp. And they're with people who are supporting them and are making them feel great about themselves and their differences and their similarities. And I get two kids that are working together and apart and together and apart. So it's an interrelationship as well as a camp and a learning experience. It's so fulfilling when I get letters. One stands out for me, a, a boy who was 14 with Asperger's, and we gave him a grant to go to a drama camp. He wrote to us and said, Dear Act Today, thank you for letting me belong for the first time in my life. These kids are remarkable. You know, we underestimate them. They're so knowledgeable, they're so capable, and we can change the life of a family, which means changing the life of a community.
Welcome back to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy, with just Shannon this week. Our thoughts go out to Nancy and hope that she's recuperating after a spill that she took over the weekend. I wanted to take just a couple of minutes. It's like it's theater week here at uh, Autism Live, and you know I love that. Um, but yesterday on the show, we had two incredible young women who uh, were here talking about unified theater and a, a very special program that they brought, brought to Los Angeles. Angeles, but exists uh, primarily at this moment in time on the East Coast, and they're looking to go all over the United States, which I think is remarkable, and bringing together true inclusion theater to middle schools and to high schools. What a, what a beautiful vision. And they had gotten together over a period of five days, only five days, with a group of kids, some who are of special needs and some who weren't, and put together a performance that it all culminated in that performance last night. So my son and I went off to this performance last night. We couldn't wait to see it. And uh, Wyatt, Nancy's son, was featured in the performance. And so that was a big thrill for Jem that he was going to get to see his friend Wyatt. And I love being able to take my son to theater. I think, you know, that it's just a, a fun and awesome thing to be able to do. The performance, you guys, was just so wonderful. It was, I tell you what, uh, I don't think that there was a dry eye in the house. Everybody, we... It was funny, it was heartwarming, it was poignant, it was just beautiful. And every aspect of it, the kids had been involved in, that, you know, they had made the scenery, um, their artwork was featured wildly throughout the show, uh, they had made the props that they were doing, they had even scripted the show, what it was that they were going to say. So they were, uh, you know, it was more than just a performance, but it, the performance was the culmination. It was absolutely brilliant, and Wyatt was a rock star, we just so loved being able to see it and uh it was fascinating to me and i i'll tell you what i was really struck by was that i think i'm doing you know i i have lots of things to say about other people about how they should include our kids right i'm like you know people need to educate their kids and what are they thinking you know right um and and then we sat there in the audience and i saw you know i need to point that finger at myself and i need to be doing a better job of uh you know i like to think that i'm talking to my son about how everybody's different but i'm always playing putting it in the context of him. And it really came home to me last night that I, it's not always, I mean, sometimes I think to say, you know, this person has this ability and this person has that ability, but I'm not doing it enough. And that was brought home to me last night. There was, <coughs> excuse me, um, in the beginning of the show, the kids would come out at four at a time and they would stand on the stage and they would say their name and they say would say, hi, I'm, you know, Wyatt and I'm a baseball player, right? And they would hold a prop that was for the thing that they felt they identified with, right? Um, you know, they might say, I'm a singer or I like to write or I'm an artist, whatever it was that made them unique and special, you know, that thing that you, you know, your passion. And so that was lovely to see and get to know all the kids that way. But in one of the groups of four kids that came out there was a young man in a wheelchair with assistive technology to speak and my son just like he he sat up and he was like what and and I and I'm going what is going on with him and he said to me is he like Hawking's uh, of course talking about Stephen Hawking's because he thinks of Stephen Hawking's as this you know superhero which I love but it occurred to me that I haven't introduced him to enough other people so that he thinks that everybody who's in a wheelchair using assistive technology is somehow, I don't know, related to Stephen Hawking's. It was just this weird, and he was, you know, so excited into it, but it wasn't reading that way in the audience, and I was cringing. And, and, and then at one point, he had a question because the kids were singing, and, and the young man who was using the assistive technology was, you know, he, he was singing as well. It was just playing off of his iPad which was attached to the speaker and Jem had never seen that before right a group of people singing with somebody who's singing uh, uh, via assistive technology so this was fascinating to him but he was leaning over and saying to me is the Hawking's guy is that him singing and of course I'm like oh my gosh and I said to him you you have to stop referring to him that way you cannot that's not appropriate and so we had a big conversation about it after the show but here's the thing about it was that he just thought he was so cool he just thought that he was the coolest person up on that stage and he wanted to meet him. That was a rock star to him. And um, so, you know, I took him down afterwards and there were a couple of kids that he wanted to meet. And um, 
so he wanted to meet this young man. And, and I, I said to my husband, I said, I hope his mom understood that he was just, he just thought he was so cool. I hope, you know, it, it was a really interesting thing for me to be on the other side of that. And I thought, boy, and we talked a lot about it on the way home. And, you know, and, and he's got it all in the right place. He's like, yeah, but they're just, you know, we're just all different and it's okay to be different. And, um, but, you know, some of his language. I said, you know, we wouldn't want to refer to somebody, you wouldn't want somebody to refer to you as the autistic kid, right? And he goes, well, no, because that's just, you know, one little part of me. It's not the whole of me. And I said, well, you know, I'm just going to guess that he wouldn't want to be referred to as the Hawking's guy. Um, you know, and and our, our kids are so special and they're so unique. And I didn't want to squelch his excitement, but I definitely wanted to channel it and put it in a form that would not be offensive. Um, and I, I was a little like, oh, what are people going to think? And I, uh, you know, I worried about what his mom thought. Uh, but the performance was wonderful. It was so exciting to see the kids interacting. And there were a couple of times in the show when, I mean, I, I have no idea watching the show. Obviously, there are some kids that their difference is visible, right? And for other kids, it isn't. And I was very aware of that with my son, that afterwards, when he was asking some questions, I could tell people, there were some people who were automatically assuming that he was neurotypical, and then there were other people who didn't, and because it's not as visible on my child, right? And the same was true of some of the kids in the performance. You really couldn't tell who's got an issue here and who doesn't, which was lovely. But throughout the show, there were a couple of times when, you know, all different abilities of kids needed a little prompting or needed a little help to know you need to come over here. And it was lovely to see how the group did it, how the kids did it for each other in a very kind and, and patient way. And you guys know I, I, you know, theater is my background and I love working with kids and doing theater. And I... I always say to kids that I'm working with, you know, I can't stand it when I watch a performance with younger kids and somebody drops a line and then people start being mean to them on stage. Oh, I can't stand that. And uh, there's one performance in particular that I had nothing to do with because I would have lost my mind. Uh, but it was at my son's school and there were two kids who stood on stage and they started an argument on stage. It's your line. You're supposed to do it. Give me the microphone. No, you give me the microphone. And they were talking to each other that way. And, and I always like to talk to young actors and say, we don't know it's a problem unless you tell us it's a problem, right? So if you say to somebody, you're supposed to be here, now I know it's a problem. Whereas before I didn't know it was a problem, right? It was so refreshing to see a group of kids and they would say to something about, uh, it was one point that one of the kids said to one of the other kids, I would love it if you would come over here and be with me. And so the child did, right? Instead of saying, you're supposed to be over here, it was, I would love it if you would come over here and be with me. I just thought that was really, really refreshing and important and how luscious that they got the opportunity to learn those words that I can ask somebody to come this way. And they got the luscious opportunity to feel of what is it like when I'm not doing exactly what I'm supposed to do and people are kind to me. Uh, you can't buy that. You really can't buy that. So again, unified theater. Uh, I just thought that they were remarkable. I want to try to get it into my son's school. And I think that if you have somebody who's in middle school or high school, I want to urge you to reach out to them. And um, it, their, their Twitter is at Unified Theater. Their website is www.unifiedtheater.org. And I, and I also want to give another big shout out to the sponsors who are making it possible, the corporate sponsors, State Farm, Bank of America, Newman's Own Foundation, CVS Caremark, Coca-Cola, uh, Starbucks, the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, Alex and Annie, and I cannot read what that other one is. Oh, no, no, I know exactly what it is. It's the Doug Flute. Foundation, of course. I just recognized what the logo was. So uh, I want to give a big thanks to all of those corporations for seeing something that was worthwhile to invest in, our kids, all of our kids, and theater. All right, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back with more of Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. Stick with us. Skills is an online program that provides assessment, curriculum, positive behavior support planning for challenging behavior, 
and progress tracking, and it does this all in one place. The skills assessment and curriculum addresses eight areas of development, which even includes advanced higher level areas such as executive functions and cognition, which pretty much makes skills the only ABA-based set of curricula for teaching more complex skills, things like problem solving, planning, self-management, perspective taking, and even inferring and predicting others' private events. Skills is a four-step system. Step one is to add the child to your account. Step two is to start assessment. The skills assessment is the only ABA-based assessment with psychometric research demonstrating the language subscale to have excellent reliability. Every area of human functioning and typical child development from infancy to adolescence was researched, making the skills assessment the most comprehensive of its kind in the world, and we're quite proud of that. Skills is easy to use. Simply click Start Assessment and begin answering questions, or simply type in a keyword find specific activities to assess, and add activities to treatment. Step 3. Choose activities. Once you've completed the assessment, Skills selects from a pool of 4,000 activities categorized by age, level, and skill type to provide you with exactly those activities each child needs. Start by choosing a curriculum, then a lesson, and finally an activity. Click the information icon to view prerequisites, ages in which targets develop, examples, and IEP goals. Click the video icon to watch a short video. Once you've identified an activity you want to teach, adding activities to treatment is a snap. Step 4. Start treatment. Here you can access customizable activity lesson details, add your own customized targets and exemplars, and edit an activity status such as introducing or mastering it. You can even print handouts such as worksheets, tracking forms, visual aids, and other materials. Skills also offers multiple progress charts, mapping curriculum progress, lesson progress, and cumulative number of activities and targets mastered over time. The Skills Language Curriculum is categorized by verbal behavior type so that users can identify progress for verbal operants, such as echoics, mans, tax, and interverbals. Skills is one of the only programs that provides the ability to write behavior intervention plans, or BIPs, for challenging behavior. With just a few clicks, the outline of the behavior intervention plan is written for you and ready to be printed and implemented. You can learn more about Skills today and get started by visiting us at www.skillsforautism.com or you can call us at 877-975-4559. Skills. Progress starts here. Welcome back to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. If you're just tuning in, it's just me today. Uh, Nancy Osbaugh Jackson is not able to be with us. She's recuperating from a spill that she took on Saturday. She's doing okay though, and we love that she's taking a little bit of time to, to get better before she's back here. We also, uh, Elaine, Coach Elaine Hall was scheduled to be with us, and unfortunately we just received a message that she's not gonna be able to be with us, so we apologize for that. We'll have her on the show another time, and of course she was gonna talk to us about the Miracle Project. You remember Coach E. Uh, she was instrumental in Autism the Musical. She's creating more programs. Just got a grant from the NEA, but that's not the only place she got a grant from. Autism Care and Treatment Today has also given a grant to the Miracle Project for, for something that they're doing this summer. I don't want to give it all away, but it's a pretty exciting opportunity. If, if you're someone who is in the Los Angeles area with a teenager that you'd like to have involved in a theater project and really really an intensive theater project. I believe it's four weeks long this summer. Make sure that you notify us or notify the Miracle Project because they've got a very special event that they're doing this summer. So starting in just a few weeks. And there'll be more of that, not just in Los Angeles, but around the country, perhaps around the world. But we'll save all of that for Kochi to tell us when the next time she is here. I wanted to ask a question, if the viewer is still watching, that asked a question during Ask Dr. Doreen about parent training. If you are a card parent, can you please write to me and tell me which office you're in? I would love to have that information. And I mentioned at the start of the show that we're all uh, saddened this morning to hear of the death of Maya Angelou. And uh, what an incredible 
incredible, strong woman, somebody that I quote all the time. She will be so sorely missed, and I promise that throughout the show I would share with you great Maya Angelou quotes. So I'd like to read to you her poem, Phenomenal Woman. It's the kind of thing, this is the best gift to put on a card uh, to a woman who's just, you know, feeling it and not feeling like those cover girl, you know, the, the, the models that look so thin that, you know, they, they would cough if you gave them a cracker. Uh, so her poem, Phenomenal Woman. Pretty women wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model's size. But when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say, it's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the stride of my step, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. Love it. Empowering. Put that on your bathroom mirror every morning. Uh, also love this. Uh, ask for what you want and be prepared to get it. <laughs> right? Uh, it's a good watchword to live by. Uh, and then she also says, if I'm not good to myself, how can I expect anyone else to be good to me. These are the important lessons in life. All right, we are going to take a short break and we're going to be back more Autism Live after these messages. The Institute for Behavioral Training provides courses in applied behavior analysis for the treatment of autism. Access IBTE learning videos on the move and learn at your own pace. talk a little bit about intensity. IBT e-learning makes any location your classroom on the go. So our objectives for today are to really learn what is autism and how is it diagnosed. Get professional guidance with IBT face-to-face -face training. IBT face-to-face -face training courses prepare you to effectively implement ABA-based interventions. Choose between small group and one-to-one -one instruction. Earn BCBA supervision hours via one-to-one -one video conferencing. So I had a chance to review your BIP today. You know what? It looked really good. You did a good job with that. IBT, continuing education courses. Earn credit through webinars, conferences, article reviews, and e-learning videos. You can learn more at ibehavioraltraining.com. IBT, 360 degrees of ABA training. Welcome back to Autism Live. There's a topic that none of us really wants to talk about, but it's important that we address it. There are shocking news stories that are uh, coming in all the time on the internet about games that kids will play with other kids that have some really devastating effects. Of course, we reported on this show about the the teenager who uh, his two female friends decided to play some games with him that involved torturing him, right? We talked about that before. Uh, there was a new case that came out yesterday of a teenager that was playing a game with a bunch of friends where they uh, tied him to a shop shopping cart and then the shopping cart rolled into a nearby body of water and he subsequently drowned and everybody thought it was a game. Now even today uh, there's a new case coming out of an autistic teen who is in the hospital because of something called a knockout game and this comes to us from Covington. Uh, Covington teen with autism is recovering in the hospital after he was knocked out in, one, in, in what some people call the knockout game. The boy was struck struck so hard his jaw was broken in two places and he underwent surgery. He has autism and he would never hurt anybody, said a Covington mother who did not want to be identified. The woman believes that her son was the victim of this game and that he is still recovering from a blow that he never saw coming. Uh, we cannot think that it's okay because it's not and I don't want uh, them to think that they got away with it, she said. The boy was walking home from the library when the attack happened. His mother says he passed a group of teens who went to a nearby high school. All of a sudden, the boy in the maroon shirt came up from behind him, punched him from behind in his face until he fell to the ground. This is from his mother. The The child was not, uh, he was not bothering anybody at the park, uh, and they are not going to follow him all the way over here to do something like that, said a neighbor who lives nearby and called the police. 
uh, he did have to be taken to the hospital, and his jaw, they confirmed, was broken in two places. He had to have surgery on Saturday morning, and he now has four plates and 15 screws in his mouth. He can't open his mouth any more than a half an inch and is now completely liquefied diet for the next eight weeks. I think it's really important, um, first of all, that we be talking about these kinds of things with our kids on the autism spectrum if they are they have enough autonomy that they are walking around in the world. I know I spoke to my son after the um, the case of the the boy with the two girls that were friends, and we we had another discussion about do your friends do things to hurt you? Are they really a friend if they're doing those things? Uh, because we need to shore our kids up. That's not going to be enough, and I think it's important that we talk about these kinds of things with our friends who have neurotypical children. And of course, we know that one of the best things that we can do to bullyproof our children uh, is to give them a community. That all kinds of studies have been done about all different kinds of ways of dealing with bullying, right? And there are many different things that you can do, and we know that the better the child's self-esteem, then the less likely that they are going to be bullied, but that doesn't completely bullyproof them, right? But what we do see time and time again in the studies that actually works is when the child has some sort of a community because bullies tend not to attack kids that are in groups because bullies are usually people who are feeling small inside and they're not going to go up against something where they think they're going to get pushed back. Plus which, if there is an opportunity and uh, a child is being bullied, if another child steps in, it's less likely that the bullying will continue. Um, and especially if there's more than one child who steps in and says, no, we're not doing that. It is amazing. You know, it, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it, it creates some trepidation in me because I have always been one of those people who can't control myself. I see something going on, I'm going to intervene, and people I'm with are like, what are you crazy? You're going to get yourself killed. And I don't think in the moment. And it worries me about my child because I see him having that same instinct, and I don't want to teach him to be afraid to help other people. I really don't. But I, I understand now why people have been afraid to be with me all these years. When I just jump in, I can think of years ago when there was a uh, we were at a firework event on the 4th of July and I had all of my sister's kids with me and my mother and there were two men who started a fist fight and pulled knives and there had to have been 500 people standing around and I was the idiot who stepped in and said oh no we are not doing this oh no I don't think so um and my mother was you know had a hold of my shirt and said get back here and uh, rip my shirt because I didn't even, I, it's, it's like I get tunnel vision and I see the same thing in my child. So I now understand the trepidation that my mother and all those other people had had. But the reality is, is that the thing stopped because somebody said, oh no, we're not doing this. And, uh, and I would want to know that if that were happening to my child, that somebody would have the guts to stop and say, oh no, we're not doing this. Uh, and when they do it in numbers, then it's much more effective. So I think having our kids have a buddy at school, somebody who, you know, is looking out for them is absolutely essential, whether you script that and go to your school and say, I need to know that somebody is looking out for my kid, or you do it in a, a less specific way. I was saying yesterday that one of the things that I made sure that I did at my son's school is that I volunteered and I got to know the kids and I would go in and do a theater project with one class every year. And those kids then, uh, they were, it was, my son was always younger than them. And so they always looked out for him on the playground. Uh, now he's older than that class, but the kids that are older than him still got to do the theater project with me and they look out for my kid. And I do think, you know, everybody doesn't do theater, but whatever you do, even if you go and sit and help children read in the classroom, they recognize parents that show up. And I think bullies are less likely to inflict upon our kids when they know that somebody cares and that they have parents and that their parents are nice people and are nice to them. Um, so get get a group around your child as much as you possibly can. Is it going to completely bully proof them? No, but let's do what we can. Right. And then I thoroughly encourage you to volunteer at your child's school, get involved, be there, be involved with the kids in the neighborhood. Uh, it will make it much harder for them to perpetrate these kinds of crimes. And that's what they are crimes against our children. And, you know, we see that sometimes it is life threatening and, uh, and, 
even, you know, this young man with a broken jaw, maybe it wasn't life-threatening, but my goodness, none of us wants to see this happen to our children. We need to get on top of this for our kids' sake. Uh, it's what Maya Angelou would tell us to do, right? All right, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back. We're going to have some more Maya Angelou for you, but be writing in, especially the parent uh, who talked about wanting the RBT. I would love to know what office you are in. Stick with us. Hi, welcome to Camp Discovery, a free-to-play suite of fun, interactive learning games for kids to and up, designed by experts in autism. Camp Discovery will open your early learner to a world of new skills, shapes, numbers, colors, locations, emotions, and more. Let's get started. Please choose a level. Objects. First, Camp Discovery's Intelligent Preference Assessment determines your child's preferred reward for choosing correctly. Okay, got it! Let's play! Camp Discovery creates a motivating learning environment for your child by minimizing incorrect responses and maximizing successful ones. Find the shoes. Respond correctly and your child is rewarded with their favorite animations. You did it! Respond incorrectly and our unique prompting system guides your child to the correct answer by making it the largest choice. That's not it. Try again. Way to go! Continue to answer correctly and the size gradually reduces until the child makes the correct choice independently. You win! Success! Rewards motivate learning. Complete a round and your child is rewarded with a fun mini game. Track your child's progress with easy to read graphs. Multiple settings options allow you to customize Camp Discovery to your child's unique needs. All this in one single app, the Camp Discovery app available for free on iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon Store. Welcome back to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. As we reported at the start of this hour, Nancy Alsby Jackson is not with us. She's recuperating after uh, a spill that she took the other night. She is fine and she will be fine, but she needs to rest her head with the rest of her, which is not easy for her to do. Uh, she's probably in bed making phone calls, trying to raise money for autism. Stop it, Nancy. Rest. We want to keep you around for a long time. And of course, we were also reporting this morning, we got the terrible news that Maya Angelou is no longer with us, only in spirit. And uh, this is great, sad news. But I, I've been wanting to share with you some of my favorite Maya Angelou quotes, because she is certainly somebody that I quote on a regular basis. Uh, and she's no stranger to suffering and really understands what it is like when, uh, when there's persecution. So, uh, great quotes. She says, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. Tell your stories, tell your stories to the world. Uh, and then she goes on to say, if you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. Don't complain. <laughs> Love it. Uh, and then this is the one that I said to somebody the other day when I quoted, I said, the first time someone shows who, who they are, believe them, right? Because uh, people tell us all the time, oh, you know, I'm really bad at this, right? And we go, no, I'm sure you're not. And then they, we discover, oh, no, they meant it, right? If the first time sh someone shows you who they are, believe them. I think this is one of the biggest, hardest thing for us as women is that we want to give people a second chance. Uh, and we can, but still understand that they are who, who they are. We wait to get more information and then get the confirmation that, oh, no, when I saw that first thing, no, it was real. Uh, here's one that I love. We delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty. Isn't that the truth? Uh, she says, you may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. Uh, and, and I honestly say that this is one of my favorite of all time. Courage is the most important of all the virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. Amen to that, Maya. I couldn't find, and I wanted to get it exactly right, but uh, my all-time favorite quote of hers is about courage as well. And it's something along the lines of, true courage is when you practice what you know to be true even when it's not possible. Popular. That's courage. Uh, and forgive me for paraphrasing slightly because I just could not find it. Oh, here's uh, how much do we love this one? I do not trust people who don't love themselves and yet tell me I love you. 
There is an African saying, which is, be careful when a naked person offers you a shirt. Right? <laughs> Right? I mean, it's just so beautiful. She says, my mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive and to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. Words to live better. And of course, her most famous quote, and it's the one that helps us all to forgive ourselves. When you knew better, you did better. Or when you know better, you will do better, right? You can only truly accomplish, you can only become truly accomplished at something you love. Don't make money your goal. Instead, pursue the things you love doing and then do them so that, so well that people can't take their eyes off of you. Oh, Miss Angelo, how much you will be missed. Uh, here's another great one. Never make someone a priority when all you are to them is an option. Ladies, yes, can I get an amen? You may encounter many defeats, but you must not be defeated. In fact, it may be necessary to encounter the defeats so you can know who you are, what you can rise from, how you can still come out of it. And then the last one, which is so important, any book that helps a child to form a habit of reading, to make reading one of his deep and continuing needs is good for him. Uh, I, I know that my mother read that when my brother was having difficulty getting into reading. I come from a family of readers where we have the expression, eating a book, that you sit down to read a book and you just don't do anything else till you're done with it. And my family uh, are people who would do that on a daily basis. My mother would go to the library and come home with a shopping bag and that would be twice a week, right? And my brother just wasn't into it. He just wasn't having it. He, you know, we'd all be at the dinner table, you know, with our books eating as we're reading and my brother was bored out of his mind. And, uh, but what he loved to read were comic books. And we had one teacher that she was saying, don't let him do that. He'll never read. And my mother said, I don't think so. And I know uh, she had read Maya Angelou and said, you know, we're going to encourage the reading in whatever form it comes in. And my brother is a great reader now, reads obsessively. So uh, there you have it. I, I have to tell you at the end of the show, we've got a lot of exciting things that are coming up tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Del uh, Nadowski is going to be with us and Dr. Jonathan Tarbox is going to be with us and they're going to be answering your questions live on the show. So it promises to be a very exciting show. By the way, programming note, next Tuesday, we're going to have Joanna Lara with us again, talking about autism and movement. Really excited to have her. We will not be doing live shows next Wednesday or Thursday. My kid is turning 11 and I got to take some time with him. He's doing a play and we're going to do some fun stuff. So we will not, we'll only be doing one show live next week. That's on Tuesday, but then we'll be back the week after. We've got some really exciting exciting things coming in the pipeline. Uh, we have a wonderful guest that is going to be joining us from the Simons Foundation of uh, Autism Research like no other organization. Uh, and we're going to have Wendy Chun with us talking about that. Really exciting. We're out of time. Give your kiddos a hug for me. Bye-bye for now.